as a data engineer, you will be using AWS everywhere, which is why I've put together this playlist for you to get up to speed quickly about all of these various tools you hear, you know, S3, Lambda, you know, you've, you've already seen a few at this point. And today we're gonna focus on S3. Now, if you haven't uh, dug into S3, one of the things you'll find out very quickly is basically a lot of what we do as data engineers at this point is built on S3. In fact, I'm gonna try to find a LinkedIn message or LinkedIn post from someone that point out the fact that if there was an S3 outage uh, today, it would take out like most of, you know, all of our analytics because, you know, Snowflake's built on top of S3. A lot of people are building their data lakes and data lake houses on top of S3. And it really is heavily relied upon um, if you are a data engineer for various components along the process, right? If you were to put up uh, the data engineering pipeline, you'll likely see it technically uh, when you ingest data, you might extract your data from an API or from a source like we did in the last video. And I'll show you a different uh, script here with a Lambda in a second as well into S3. And then from that S3, bucket you'll likely put it into snowflake or maybe databricks and on the snowflake side it's also likely dumping it into s3 if you're on aws so s3 plays this role where it's kind of throughout the whole process you use it over and over again and so in this video we're going to talk about what s3 is and show you a few examples of where you can use it maybe you're using athena and you'd like to query on top of an s3 file or maybe you're just trying to push a file into snowflake with that let's dive into what is s3 so what is s3 uh, basically uh as its name maybe suggests a little bit it's simple storage service so three s's s3 uh, simple storage service if you're looking for a place to essentially dump almost anything could be a csv could be an image file could be a video often a lot of people even sometimes host content for the website on s3 so like your javascript css scripts a lot of stuff can go and be used and stored in s3 and as data engineers, we heavily rely on it for a place to often either store data in the meanwhile while we're processing it, maybe like a staging step, or maybe as the final step, maybe we've kind of built this data lake, data lake house, whatever you're gonna call it, where you're actually now querying from. Fun fact, S3 was one of the first services, if not the first service that was released back in, I think 2006. Uh, I always put up this diagram to show you kind of what services were released. Now, there's a few things that are important to understand about S3, which one of the things is that there's different flavors essentially, or different options, tiers that you can use based on how often you're going to actually pull your data, right? You've got your standard option, which as the name suggests is kind of your standard way. If you've ever set up an S3 bucket, that's likely what you've used. You have basically S3 intelligent or the intelligent version, which may or may not be clear by the name, but essentially what it tries to do is automatically figure out, you know, whether or not your object and an object level is being grabbed frequently. Oh, also <laughs> objects basically refer to any bit of the, you know, CSV file image, et cetera. Those are all objects, right? Those are one object, but yeah, they look at those objects and see how frequently you access them. And based on how frequently you access them, they will put them in the right tiering. So standard or the other one, which would be Glacier. And now there's a few options there in terms you can, you can look up um, the different tiering there, but as the name suggests, it's a little bit slower. Um, so it's a little cheaper because most likely wherever you're grabbing from it essentially isn't what you consider hot storage, right? Like it's something that you might not want to grab often. Maybe you're archiving data or archiving something. So you're storing it there. One of the companies I worked at, especially since we had healthcare data, we had to always keep a certain amount or certain years of data, but also we didn't want to keep all of it past a certain date. So we would move it over to Glacier to essentially make sure we weren't paying a ton of money for it. And so that's kind of your basic tiering. If you ever use S3, likely you kind of understand that again, there are objects, which are files or, or images or text. It kind of ranges really from any type of thing that you could put into your normal folder on your computer, essentially, you can put uh, an S3 uh, bucket with the limit of currently five terabytes. So anything above five terabytes, you're gonna have to likely break up. Now, what are the benefits of using S3, right? Like why would I want to use this service? And generally the things that you'll often hear people say is it offers a few things. One thing is durability and availability. S3 provides a lot of, you know, high kind of durability. It's supposed to have like basically 99.99, nines uh, of durability. So in theory, it shouldn't fail. Scalability, right? You can pretty much store data as much as you need. It doesn't, you're not going to have to ever provide vision a certain amount of uh, data or space it just stores as much as you want security to an extent it depends on how you set it up you know you'll often see s3 as one of the key pieces of security issues that often happen i'll try to put a few articles here of s3 data breaches because it's really easy to misconfigure something even though it defaults to blocked uh, public access you know all it takes is someone setting it to be accessible to the web and then anyone can essentially access your bucket because it's just a url people love it for kind of its general cost effectiveness obviously it's always cheapest to store things locally or to have your own server 
to a degree in, t in, in terms of like how much that space costs minus without considering things like overhead and someone to manage it. But in terms of like storage costs, it's it's going to likely be the cheapest. The, again, there's always a margin that a cloud company will put on top of these services. They're going to make money on it. But especially if you're a small company, it's, it's really good. But large companies also benefit from it. A lot of people love it for data transfers, right? Like instead of using SFTP or something like that, you might be using that for your data transfer or maybe even distribution of data, not just for transferring data because you're sharing it with another company, but also maybe for something like like distributing data across multiple regions so that someone can access the same, you know, we referenced earlier, like website content in multiple locations. So there's a ton of benefits you get and we'll kind of keep them up here for a few seconds, but that's why a lot of people like S3. It's very simple to use. You know, all you can do is essentially get or put data into it. So either pull that data back or push a new file in, do a few other basic things, but that's really what you can do. Now let's from here, dive into the actual tool S3, uh, how you can use it, um, how we've used it already. And and uh, you know, kind of go from there. So we've talked a little bit about what S3 is. Now let's kind of use it. Uh, in this case, we're gonna query data in, using Athena, but let's first start by creating a bucket. You go to create a bucket, you can pick which region you essentially set the bucket in, which is important. If you have one of your other components, whether it's, you know, Lambda or uh, another component in a different region, you are gonna run into issues if they're not, again, all in the same region. So make sure you pick the right region. Um, you can kind of scroll through and see what you have, you know, likely it'll be something like whatever California West or something like that. You will then name it for now. We'll just do SDG test uh, one. From there again, it defaults to blocking all public access. That is that is the default. It will block public access, which is probably something you want uh, just to be more secure to start with, but you can obviously take this off and then pick uh, which ways you want to grant data here um, below. But start off with, you know, block all public access. You can set up versioning. So this means like as you're loading files into it, if you have like the same file name, it will literally start like versioning um, those file names so that you can keep it over a longer period of time. And then from there, there's some other configurations that you probably won't set up. And then it's just as easy as create bucket. Nope, what did I, the name it? I figured, yeah, I was gonna say, I knew there was always, there's one character I always forget that's, so yeah, it's the other way. You gotta do hyphen not underscore. All right, so this is essentially what a bucket looks like. It, it's, it doesn't look fancy. You can create a folder in here. So, you know, maybe it's a month folder. Maybe you're trying to put data in there in certain partitions, or maybe you're often storing it. Like if you're thinking of like creating a data lake, you'll often see people kind of store it generally like systems. So like what systems does data come from? Like is it HubSpot, is it Salesforce or something like that? Then from there, it'll usually be something like entity. Uh, so in HubSpot, is this a customer? What is, you know, what is this? And then maybe something around date, like month or day. And then it might be like year, month, date time um, to kind of partition it essentially. And I'll put up kind of some ideas about like how you can partition things here. Uh, so you get an idea of like how you can do that. So maybe we'll say HubSpot just for the sake of it. And now you've got a folder. And again, from here, you can just upload data uh, the same way you'd ever upload data um, to anything online, or you can automate it. In our last example, we showed you how you can do that, how you can use uh, Lambda to do that, essentially. Uh, as kind of a quick reminder, also put this script up or below, so now we can get some crime data. So the old one was like weather data, we were only getting one row. So now we're gonna pull in a ton of data, but it's not off an API. In this case, we're just pulling it off of a CSV file that exists. So this CSV file is actually Denver CSV data. It's literally just crime data from, from Denver. So you can go here and find that CSV, you can just download it automatically. And then basically, I'm putting it into this bucket um, and under this object name here. So um, it's just going to this crime, uh, Denver crime data.csv. Again, if you want to make this better, you would put in a timestamp um, and then kind of do that month date uh, kind of partition that I said, but we're just doing this basic example. Um, and maybe as I kind of build this project, I might actually do that here and we'll, we'll kind of build this out, but just want to show the first version. So you can see here again, you're just going to upload that file object here. So now again, we've, I've already done this. So we're going to go to Athena and we're going to show you how you can actually query data using Athena to essentially query data straight from an S3 bucket. So if I go to Athena, and again, Athena is just essentially um, Presto or Trino. It's kind of this query engine. It's really just a query engine that sits on top of other data sources generally and uses thing like Hive Metastore to kind of keep track of all that data. So you'll notice I have two, of course I have one underscore one, uh, uh, tables here that I created and we'll kind of go over why. Um, basically I created this first one <laughs> and uh, when I ran it, you will notice obviously this data is kind of, kind of messed up. So when you're creating your table, so go to create, you're, you can point to an S3 bucket. You can give it a table name, obviously, you know, crime, Denver, et cetera. Um, I already have now a database that essentially exists. 
um, but you can create one if you don't have one. You can point to essentially the location of the folder. So it doesn't have to point to the CSV. And this is why eventually you can actually start setting up partitions. And I'll show you, you know, I'll put up uh, here how you can do like S3 partitions, essentially, that it can then kind of have a good idea of like how things are broken down uh, by month and things like that. They tell you right here. So you can essentially set up partitions like this. So when you create that folder and that way, so when I point to like, let's say again, um, this has logs and this kind of goes back to like this this right here would be your like hubspot or whatever your core system is uh underneath that would be the entity so customer and then from there like i said earlier you're gonna have that year month and then you're gonna add this equals to and that kind of tells it and distinguishes to it like oh this is like a partition and does that automatically and then it knows like basically all the data underneath so you could have multiple csvs and it would know how to query underneath without it treating it essentially like a csv and treating it more like a table and this is where I messed up. So, uh, and that's why I have two tables. So when I go to CSV, I was like, oh yeah, this is just a comma delimited file. And I forgot that uh, if you're using uh, essentially Hive, you also need to tell it <laughs> if there's other things it's delimited by essentially. So I had to do uh, this. So actually when it Facebook, these were part of the parameters that when you created your tables, you would, you would reference. But yeah, I had to double quote this. So that was, that was the gotcha for me. So if you ever create a table here, you got to use um, the open CSV essentially service versus the lazy, simple uh, file loader. So that's the difference there really um, make sure you have double quotes. And uh, that's why I have two tables. Then from there, you have to essentially specify the columns, which I just use the bulk add columns, which just as it says, just column name plus data type. Uh, it will automatically essentially start filling this out for you. So like once you bulk it, it will automatically fill these out for you. And if you have a data type does, that doesn't match something that Hadoop or, or, or Hive expects, you'll just, it'll leave it blank and you'll have to go through and fix it. For example, I had Varchar and you just have to specify here. Um, it's a little frustrating, but that, that's just what you have to do. There's some other table properties that you'll have to deal with, but that's really kind of the key, key uh, overview of it. So going back here again, now we have that CSV file. This is actually the same CSV file that we're pointing at because I had to do it twice. Um, just fixed it the second time. All right. So now, like I said, you can essentially query data from that CSV file, but again, it can be more complex than just one single CSV file. You can literally be loading multiple parquet files, multiple CSV files, whatever it might be uh, every day, kind of partition them. So if I hit run, right, you can essentially see below. Uh, the data that we're pulling in, uh, I had, I forgot that this was actually a big int. So I did have to change this more to a big int. Um, you have some other codes here, um, some IDs that they decided to call IDs, even though they're more of, of a code. Like I would consider this a code more than this a code. Like to me, this is a code and some dates, uh, that were a little more complex. So I will need to reformat that in the long run. Like you can't just expect that to work. Uh, you can actually see, uh, the location of, uh, the geos and the geo long and lat lat of this. Uh, again, this is Denver crime data. So it literally says like how many people were involved, uh, the type of, of incident that occurred, when it occurred. This specific data set uh, I'm curious about because I now live in Denver. Also, uh, I honestly had in <laughs> my own little incident recently where we had our car broken into. So suddenly you're kind of interested in uh, Denver crime data. So I think this could be a fun project uh, I might build out over time using maybe a, maybe not Athena in the long run. I just like showing that you can use Athena sitting on top of S3. That is a common practice. Instead, I might uh, use something more like Snowflake or Databricks. The other thing then now that we've referenced Snowflake that you can do is actually have it so that when new files are loaded into your S3 bucket, you can actually have it automatically piped into Snowflake using Snowpipe. Um, I was going to add that actually as part of this video, but one, it's going to take a long time. And two, I found another video that does a great job at doing that. So I'm going to put it up here and I'll uh, point to it below. So you guys can check out that video and learn how you can actually uh, pipe uh, automatically S3 files into Snowflake. Although we'll see if that's how the future is. And there's a lot of people who are actually now kind of just setting up data lakes-ish, data lake houses-ish in S3, um, in Parquet files often or, or something. And then maybe having Iceberg involved or something similar. And then essentially being able to pick which engine uh, they sit on top. So that's kind of a, a new, I think, approach that people are taking. I'm not gonna say everyone's doing it. And honestly, for some companies that are smaller, I'm gonna say just sticking with whatever, you know, system you're using, whether that's Snowflake, Databricks, Postgres, BigQuery, it's going to be simpler and less complex in terms of people time. The whatever benefits you would get from like improving query performance or maybe query costs is going to be mitigated by the human costs on the other side. If you've got like 
two employees were having to like uh, deal with this and you're not having that much of a query load. I don't think you're going to be saving that much if you try to like figure out which is the optimal engine to run for which problem. But for larger companies, I can see that being valuable. But that's that's basically S3 guys. We gave you an intro. We showed you kind of how you can use it. We've given you a script now, two different lambdas that you can use essentially to load data into S3 and then showing you that you can use Athena on top of that. And yeah, look at that. You can now query data. So hopefully this was helpful. Um, we'll add some more to this in the next video. I'm not actually sure which tool will use. So if there's a specific tool you'd like to see, um, show them below, but we've already gone over event bridge, Athena, S3, Lambda. We probably still need to go over some things like uh, MWAA, uh, Airflow, IAM, and then start putting this all together. I think there is kind of a mini project here that I didn't realize was going to come out. I was just going to make this uh, a bunch of how to's of different solutions, but I, I'm kind of seeing something here that we could start going towards and perhaps having less stress of like an actual project at the end will make it come out more naturally versus my other three videos where I don't have projects. I can completely finished. So hopefully this was helpful. Let me know if you have any thoughts or any tools you want to see next in particular, but I've got a few that I've been thinking of. Uh, comment below with those tools. And uh, other than that, guys, see you in the next one. Thanks and goodbye.